Yes. Uh, right there will be fine. Please open it up. are now deeply divided over matters of policy and commerce. Each state pursues its own destiny, which weakens our trade abroad and creates near anarchy at home. Unless a means can be found to unite the states, I fear the worst for my country. Its life may be as the flame of a candle, bright, but brief. Good journey to you, sir. Thank you, my friend. That wasn't our understanding. That's what I said, and that's the price. That's flat robbery. It's even more than you wrote in your letter. Sorry, squire. And you'll have to put the price down on your tobacco and grain because the tariff's going up again. I won't do it. And I won't pay your price for this lot either. Take it back. Take it all back. Take it all back. I have here a resolution which grants to the United States Congress of Confederation the power finally to regulate the trade of this country. Not again, Mr. Madison. Yes, again, Mr. Lee. All those in this house know you wish to strip Virginia of her God-endowed right to regulate her own trade. Virginia does not regulate her trade, sir, nor does any other state in the Union. Great Britain controls it. Go down to the docks and see for yourself. Indeed. We charge the British nothing for the privilege of trading with us. Meanwhile, they charge us huge tariffs. If the British regulate our trade abroad, Mr. Mason, let us, by all means, restrict theirs here. But as Virginians, let us not empower Congress to join us with avaricious New Englanders. What about, what about avaricious Southerners? Southerners. Southern state governments, indeed the state houses in every corner of the Union, reek with corruption. The result, gentlemen, this nation becomes every day weaker. Her borders threatened by Spain to the west, Great Britain to the north. Can't you see, Mr. Lee, the glory of the revolution is being blasted. The states must renounce their jealousies and give some power to a national government, otherwise America will dissolve. Mr. Madison, you may speechify as long as you like about a national government and America. We here in the House of Delegates are Virginians. First, last, and always. could just get the states together to talk outside their cursed legislatures. Talk about what? We'll talk about trade, about laws, about a more effective union, about anything. If, if honest, influential men 
met together representing their states, men like General Washington and Dr. Franklin and yourself, sir. I have the greatest admiration for your writing Virginia's Constitution and her Declaration of Rights. Sir, may I count on your help? I am a friend to your cause, sir. But the indispensable friend is General Washington. As he goes, so goes America. Yes, sir, and we must get him. Unless our national government is strengthened, the states will soon turn to the sword to resolve their separate jealousies. Think of it. Standing armies in every state, and each state the sport of foreign powers setting the people against one another. Back to the Dark Ages. You sound like John Adams. <laughs> Do I? Perhaps we need Mr. Adams back here from London. He could, he could wake us up. <laughs> At the moment, I think he's trying to wake up the British Ministry. The Foreign Secretary will see you now, Mr. Adams. Not before time. Allow me to introduce you, sir. Don't be a fool. He knows who I am. But, Mr. Adams. Lord Carmarthen, how happy I am to hear of your recovery. Oh, thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, pray be seated. Yeah. It is a pleasure to meet you at last. Your servant, sir. And may I reassure His Majesty through you, Mr. Foreign Secretary, that America is eager for an exchange of ambassadors. His Majesty hopes in time to send an ambassador. He is anxious to cultivate uh, the most cordial friendship with uh, uh, America and to try to dissipate every little animosity that might still exist between our two great countries. Indeed. In that case, Lord Carmarthen, may I tell you plainly how all animosity may be eliminated. Ah, you come with one of your famous ultimatums. I've brought nothing, sir. It is my desire that we put away our subtleties and speak as reasonable men. By all means, reasonableness and plainness. By the way, sir. I can state in two words what America desires of Great Britain. Fair trade. Pray, uh, clarify your meaning, Mr. Adams. You are obstructing our shipping and restricting our trade. You have forts within the borders of America, which you continue to occupy in direct defiance of the Treaty of 1783. Do you deny this? No, Mr. Adams, no, I certainly do not deny it. But surely you must know His Majesty is obliged to retain some official presence in your country until your countrymen choose to repay their debts to His Majesty's merchants. Choose to repay? Well, quite so, Mr. Adams. If my figures are correct, America owes His Majesty's government some 10 million pounds incurred before and since the um, late unpleasantries between our two countries. And, of course, the interest, I'm sorry to say, continues to mount. We Americans wish to pay our debts, but you make it impossible. Oh, how so? By obstructing our shipping. You call for immediate payment of all debts. And yet you block the very means whereby that payment might be effected. Let me speak plainly to you, Mr. Adams, if I may borrow that felicitous phrase from you. Please do. Speaking plainly is something I've longed to hear a minister of King George do. Cui bono? I beg your pardon? Cui bono? Who? benefits. Why should His Majesty contract a treaty of commerce with America? Who would benefit? You astonish me, sir. Oh, come, come. You Americans have discovered that, alas, you cannot supply yourselves from anywhere except His Majesty's manufacturing. And so, if I may speak plainly, British merchants may charge you what they will. Who would benefit from a change in that policy? 
Not we Britons, surely. We allow you Britons to come to all of our ports in your own ships in America without charge. Will you allow us the same privilege? Why should we allow it? You cannot avoid letting us come to your ports. You have no government to prevent it. And your squabbling states cannot agree to forbid the ships and goods, nor lay duties upon them. Until you have a government, my answer to your urgent request is, Mr. Ambassador, cui bono. You're quite right, Mr. Adams. Speaking plainly is most refreshing. <laughs> so, visit me again when you have something substantive to discuss. Good day, sir. If the Federal Convention is to be a success, General Washington must attend. Only his presence will give it the strength to form a new government and the stature to make that government acceptable to all Americans. Truly now, as in the days of the war, the fate of America lies in the hands of George Washington. My worst fears for this country are being realized. In Virginia and elsewhere, the people are burning courthouses. In Massachusetts, there's been a full-scale rebellion of ex-soldiers and farmers. In their frustration with the bad government, the people are turning to the torch and the sword. Americans have much to learn from English agriculture. Now don't change the subject, man. I tell you, there is rebellion in Massachusetts. They're burning public records in Virginia. Surely even Thomas Jefferson, the revolutionary, can see that leads to anarchy. No, John, I can't. The blood spilled in such revolts is the manure of free republics. Let the people speak, even if their voice is gunfire. But after the gunfire comes good government and good laws, which the fractured states can't seem to achieve. All the despots of Europe are waiting for America to fail, and she will, if she doesn't learn to govern herself. Well, I hear that James Madison has persuaded a convention to be held in Philadelphia in May to revise the Articles of Confederation. More talk. Well, I have faith in Madison. For the task at hand, he's the greatest man in America. I've been sending him books on government, and I hear there's a chance that General Washington may attend. Well, if Washington can be persuaded to descend from Mount Vernon, there might be a chance this convention will be more than just talk. General, you are the indispensable man. Without you, we are without hope. If we persuade Congress to authorize a convention, you must come. Respectfully, James Madison. I 
I believe the scheme of a convention is sound. As to my attending, you must know, Mr. Madison, that I am a private man now. I brought the ship safely into port. I will not again embark on the sea of public troubles. Your humble and obedient servant, George Washington. You told the Congress what? I told them the general would attend the convention in Philadelphia. But he hasn't given his consent. But he must. Didn't you say he must? Yes, yes, but... I believe he will. Yes, but the risk you're taking. Your reputation. Colonel, there was no other way. Delaware, Georgia, the Carolinas, in fact, all of them said they would appoint delegates only if General Washington attended the convention. For some months now, I have been attempting to persuade General Washington to attend our convention, but in vain. My research is virtually complete, and I, I'm confident as to the direction this nation must take. But God knows, without the general present, all my preparations will be for naught. I leave for Philadelphia without the slightest assurance that he will attend. Thought you'd want this before you went off to Philadelphia. Yes. Success to you, Mr. Madison. Thank you, Williams. Get up, get up. I regret to say that circumstances render my attendance in Philadelphia impossible. Your servant, George Washington. by to see how you're settling in. Well, I'm, I'm fine. Thank you, Mrs. House. But the last time you had to put up with one of our summers, it almost did you in, you being such a slight fellow. Now, this time, you will eat and rest properly. And I suppose I'm the one that will have to see to it that you do. Thank you. I, I appreciate your concern. Is it true? What? Is General Washington coming to Philadelphia? General Washington, do you have a letter from the general for me? Oh, oh no. I read it in the Gazette. Well, if, if the Gazette says it, it, uh, it should be true, shouldn't it? Oh, imagine the general in our city. Yes. Oh. <laughs> Thank you.
this house? gentleman or better still lady that is knocking I'm around here <laughs> oh my dear general <laughs> how delighted I am to see you sir <laughs> pray sir do not trouble yourself Quite unnecessary for the sage of Philadelphia to rise in the presence of a retired soldier. Well, if the sage cannot rise, perhaps the soldier will sit, eh? <laughs> ah. <laughs> Some tea? Thank you, Doctor. <laughs> ah. Alas, gout and the stone have made me into a monument. People must now come to view me as I am unable to go to them. <laughs> Will your health allow you to attend the convention, Doctor? Will yours, General? <laughs> it seems that fate wishes us to postpone our well-earned retirement, sir. Well, I hope our convention will do good. If it does not, it must do harm. Its failure will demonstrate that we have not wisdom enough to govern ourselves. I, of course, have selfish interest in its success. Oh, indeed. During the war, I staked my life and what is more important, my reputation, on the belief that Americans could govern themselves and that all mankind should share in that privilege. Doctor, many know by heart your credo that the rights of Americans should be the rights of all men. Well then, sir, you see the danger I'm in. If our convention fails, all mankind will suffer. Oh, much worse. I shall be discredited as a philosopher. <laughs> <laughs> oh, General, I am grateful you are here. For you, among all men, I hold in the highest esteem. When you voluntarily surrendered power after the war, I knew that in you breathed no tyrant. But that new man, an American, you are the very soul of this republic, sir. With you and our consuls, we must succeed. You overwhelm me, sir. You must know that I consider you the greatest American alive. My grave fears for the welfare of this country are lightened in your presence. Well then, let us toast ourselves with this tea and declare that the world is infinitely better off because of us. <laughs>
Gentlemen, thank you for coming. Mr. Madison and I believe it wise that we Virginians meet together to prepare for the opening of our great convention. Mr. Thank you, General. For some months now, I have been studying the governments of many nations, ancient and modern, and I have discovered that all governments have had defects. The Periclean Greeks were too autocratic. The Helvetic Confederacy... <clears throat> Pardon me, gentlemen, I do not mean to be tedious. I know that every thinking man becomes daily more alarmed at our situation. I have devised a plan of government, which I believe will help to correct the abuses in our republic. Excellent. All states look to Virginia for leadership in government. And you, Governor Randolph, will propose this plan on the first day of the convention, if you are agreeable. Of course, I am agreeable. Although it seems to me that the general... No, no, you are the governor of Virginia, sir. I am a private citizen. Does your plan improve the Articles of Confederation? It abolishes them. It does what? General seems an imposing figure. That he is, Judge Wilson. Have you never met the man? I do believe I'd be a wee bit overawed. He seems the very soul of dignity. I know the general well, and believe me, no man could be kinder. But being in his presence is rather like being with your father, your creditor, and your maker, all rolled into one. Nonsense. I've met the general, and I can assure you I'm not overawed in his presence. I'm afraid of no man on earth. <laughs> Waiter, another port, please. To abolish the articles? General, nothing less will work. The articles give the states the right to act almost as independent countries. Let us suppose that this, this teacup is our federal government as it exists under the Articles. Well, then your teacup is Congress. Indeed. And it is like Philadelphia tea, heated enough for debate, but weak. <laughs> it is a creature of the states entirely. In it, each state has one vote, and nothing decided there is binding unless there is complete unanimity in the voting, which there never is. General, may I... By all means. Most instructive. Thank you, sir. Uh, and Governor, I'll need yours as well. Yes. Colonel Mason? Thank you, sir. Now this, this is the form that I propose for our new government. Instead of a single governing body, three branches in a truly national government. And what will they be? Our first branch will be a new Congress. Oh, we already have a Congress. Yes, but ours will be different. Since our plan expands the powers of Congress, we will check that power by dividing it into two houses, an upper house and a lower house. And note, Congress will now truly represent the people of the United States for the first time in our history. How will it do that? How many inhabitants has Virginia, Governor? More than any other state, some 800,000 people. And how many votes does Virginia have in Congress today under the Articles? One. Do you know the population of Delaware? Not precisely. Uh, certainly under 100,000. Well under 100,000, Mr. Wythe. And yet how many votes does little Delaware have in Congress? One, of course. The same as Virginia. But our new Congress will make nationally binding laws. And so the people of Virginia, as all the states, must be represented fairly, in proportion to their populations. Waiter? Might I have another cup of tea? Stronger this time? <laughs> you would walk up to the general and with no prior greetings, slap him on the back and say, my dear general, how happy I am to see you look so well. Certainly, a hearty thump of fellowship. What could be more simple and congenial? Supper and wine for you and a dozen of your friends says you wouldn't dare. And a dinner from me, Mr. Lewis. <laughs> Done, gentlemen. Well, 
Go on, Mr. Morris. Waiter, another port, please. Between power and liberty. Thank you, sir. There will also be an executive branch to enforce the laws Congress passes. That wine goblet must be kept in check, lest it make itself a king. Mm -hmm. And so it shall be, Governor, by Congress, and by this mug which represents the judiciary branch, the courts of the land. Very good, Mr. Madison. Might I have the executive branch back? It needs refreshing. <laughs> Of course, General. And pardon my speaking at such length. Of course. Gentlemen, the states sent their delegates here to hold on like bulldogs to state sovereignty. Our first battle will be to get them to abandon the Articles of Confederation in favor of our new government. Difficult. Since the instructions sent with many of them specifically prohibit them from doing so. May we not say in our plan that we are merely correcting the articles and not abolishing them? Well, our plan does abolish them. But can we not say that we are correcting them? I have found that words can be crucial. The anti-nationalists may correct what they will never abolish. Well, that, that may work. You speak of a first battle, Mr. Madison. Will there be others? Yes. The smaller states will oppose our plan at all hazard. Delaware will not want to lose her disproportionate power in a Congress that makes binding laws. Nor would I, were I governor of Delaware. But they must. This battle, proportionate representation in Congress, is the battle for the soul of America. Lose it, and the states of America will never form a true union. Win it, God willing, and our nation is saved. General, to the Virginia plan. My dear General, I'm very glad to see you look so very well. Gentlemen. accept my heartfelt thanks for the honor of being elected president of this convention. I need hardly tell you that the nation watches us, as I think do the powers of heaven. Let us do our best. I, uh, Mr. Madison. Yes, General? Did you find your seat uncomfortable, sir? <laughs> With the indulgence of the members, I am moving to the front where I may more perfectly hear the proceedings and make notes of them. I wish to record the mechanisms by which our new government is created. New government? New government, Mr. Madison? Our instructions do not authorize the forming of a new government, so you, sir, may return to your seat. No new government will be formed here. Order, Mr. Bradford. Easy, men. Easy, men. These are hallowed halls. I signed a paper here which got us into a lot of trouble not so long ago. <laughs> the convention welcomes Dr. Franklin to its opening session. Thank you, Warden. You can return our sturdy friends to the jail. I think I can find my own way home. Thank you, General. You're quite welcome. Late. Oh, history will be the judge of that, James. I uh, should now like to hear from the committee on rules. 
Mr. President, the Committee on Rules proposes that all votes be recorded. Uh, Mr. President, I recognize the delegate from uh, Massachusetts, Mr. Uh, Gary, is it? Mr. King. Mr. King. I object to the recording of votes. This will restrict the free exchange of opinions. I propose that while we are debating, we resolve ourselves into a committee of the whole House, yes. Yes. and that any votes taken when the convention is so resolved be non-binding and not recorded in the minutes. Second. And we should be able to change our votes in Committee of the Whole as often as we like. We can take a binding vote when we are in General Assembly. Objections? Then Mr. King's motion passes. Might I suggest that uh, Mr. Nathaniel Gorham of Massachusetts, who has been President of Congress, be selected as Chairman of the Committee of the Whole when the Convention is so resolved? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? The vote being unanimous, we may now return to the report of the Committee on Rules. I beg your pardon, General. Yes, Major. What? Do I record that last vote in the minutes? Yes, Major. You do record this vote. Uh, when you see Mr. Gorham up here in the chair instead of me, then you do not record the vote. Oh, thank you, sir. I understand. We may never get to the plan at all. Mr. Wiss, please proceed. We propose that a rule of, of absolute secrecy be imposed on the delegates while this body meets. Thank you, Mr. Wiss. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. On this item of secrecy, let me add my personal endorsement. It will allow us all to speak our minds more freely and protect the public from those who may distort our deliberations. And now, I am, sir. Oh, your old law teacher, James. The man who wouldn't sign the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> John Dickinson of Delaware, sent to revise the articles, if need be. Welcome, Mr. Dickinson. Please take your place. <laughs> and uh, now to other business. Mr. President. I recognize the delegate from Virginia, Governor Edmund Randolph. Thank you, sir. Gentlemen, we are in crisis. There are those both at home and abroad who prophesy our downfall as United States. Why? Because the Articles of Confederation have utterly failed to accomplish what they were created for. Now, I have only the greatest respect for the authors of the Articles. They were patriots. Their efforts were adequate to their times when there were no trade wars among the states, no rebellion in Massachusetts. Or Virginia. Courts have been burned in Richmond. True, Mr. Gary, true. We live in difficult times. The Articles cannot adequately govern us. But there is a remedy, a remedy as bold as the times require. I propose that we correct and enlarge the Articles of Confederation in order that they might accomplish the objects proposed by their creation. Thank you. I now resolve this convention into Committee of the Whole House for a discussion of Governor Randolph's plan. Chairman? The Chair recognizes the delegate from Pennsylvania, Mr. Gouverneur Morris. I see an inconsistency in the very first clause of this plan. Governor Randolph, your first resolution calls for the Articles of Confederation to be, now let me get this right, corrected and enlarged. That is correct. Yet the remaining 14 articles do not do that. They abolish them. This plan calls for an entirely new government. If we are abolishing the Articles of Confederation, let us say so clearly. Governor Randolph, do you wish to reply? Yes. 
Mr. Morris, I am indebted to you for your clarification. I propose that we set aside the first clause of the Virginia Plan and in its place substitute the resolution that a national government ought to be established consisting of a supreme legislative, executive, and judiciary. The articles are thus abolished and a new form of government substituted for the old. This is the delegate from New Jersey, Mr. William Patterson. Our instructions do not even allow us to discuss a scheme in which the Articles of Confederation are abolished. We may amend them, nothing more. <laughs> struck with horror that such a thought ever occurred to Governor Randolph. He's just annihilated our government. Amen. Amen, Mr. Patterson. I was sent here from Massachusetts to amend the Articles of Confederation, not to dissolve them in the states as well. Read the plan, Mr. Gary. You'll see that it does not dissolve the states. I have read enough to see, order, and I'm not blind to the order, danger. Please. Well, if this plan will finally force the states to obey federal law, then I'm for it. I accept Governor Randolph's change. I say let's do away with the Articles. Here, here. Recognize the delegate from Connecticut, Mr. Roger Sherman. All I want to say is this. The Articles didn't give enough powers to Congress. I wrote part of them, so I know. <laughs> Let's not cut so deeply into them that the states won't agree with us. That's my say for now. Thank you, Mr. Sherman. So you are against doing away with the Articles of Confederation? That's what I just said, isn't it? <laughs> Mr. Chairman? Chair recognizes Mr. Madison. Gentlemen, the moment has arrived which is to decide whether the American experiment is to survive and be a blessing to the world or not. On the one hand, we have the Articles of Confederation. On the other, we have a proposal for an entirely new kind of government. Every day, the Union grows more impotent and her people more discontent. Is this what we wish? No. If it is true, as Mr. Patterson said, that we are authorized only to amend the Articles of Confederation, then I say let us amend them out of existence. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Chairman? The Chair recognizes the delegate from Connecticut, Mr. Roger Shem. Look. We've got to keep the state strong. Everybody knows it's only in a small republic, like a state, that popular government works. I think not so, Mr. Sherman. My research tells me that it is only in a large republic that good government is even possible. Forgive me for interrupting my colleague, but uh, Mr. Madison, don't all authorities state that Good government arises from small republics like the states? Yes, Colonel, they do. But the states? Is there good government in Rhode Island? Well, Rhode Island is too small. It's always controlled by some faction or other. Dr. Franklin, is there good government in Pennsylvania? Now, that's a, a larger state. Indeed not, Mr. Madison. The Pennsylvania legislature is controlled by a faction which is far from just. Alas, it is also far from honest. All societies are made up of warring factions. Rich against the poor. Religion against religion. Race against race. A small republic, like a state, too often falls prey to one of these factions. The result? Lawlessness and oppression especially against the minorities. It is only in a large republic with many different-minded people that no one faction can gain control. In such a republic, the liberties of all the people are naturally safeguarded. Such a republic, if it were dedicated to justice, protected by truth, and of the spirit of the people, would, I believe, last through the ages, but... First, it must exist.
I move that we vote on the change. Second. Very well. If there is no further discussion, we will vote on Governor Randolph's new resolution. Massachusetts? Aye. Connecticut? No. New Jersey? No. New York? Mr. Chairman, <laughs> Governor Clinton sent our delegation with strict instructions to oppose any attempt to diminish the sovereignty of New York. I wholeheartedly agree with these instructions, as will my colleague, Mr. Lansing, when he arrives. Since Mr. Hamilton chooses to ignore them, New York is divided. Delaware. Aye. Pennsylvania. Aye. Virginia. Aye. North Carolina. Aye. South Carolina. Aye. Very well, then. With three states absent, plus Rhode Island, of course, Mr. Randolph's resolution passes in committee, New York divided. The Articles of Confederation are abolished. Yeah, yeah. We may now discuss other resolutions of the Virginia Plan. Mr. Chairman. Chair recognizes Mr. Dickinson of Delaware. Mr. Chairman, gentlemen. I, as well as others, see the need for a change in our form of government. But now, turning to the second resolution, I see words which, unless struck out, must kill it. Resolve that the rights of suffrage in the national legislature ought to be proportioned to the number of free inhabitants. Now I turn to you, Mr. Madison, as we may perhaps suppose that yours is the mind behind the Virginia plan. Do you mean, sir, by this clause that the large states will have more delegates in the new legislature than the smaller states? Yes, because of their greater populations. And this is done in order to destroy the equality of the states in the new Congress? Most well, certainly not, sir. It is done that power might at last be derived from the people, Mr. Dickinson. <laughs> well, I'm sure this form of representation appeals to Virginia and to Pennsylvania and Massachusetts, all large states. And it may appeal to the Deep South, the Carolinas and Georgia, which believe they will become large states. But the smaller states will not accept such tyranny. delegation cannot change this system. Our instructions are clear, and if we discuss it, it will become our duty to retire from the convention. Please, Mr. Dickinson, the people, not the states, must be represented equally. Surely you can see that, sir. No, Mr. Madison. I cannot see that. Mr. Dickinson, even if you're not allowed to vote for proportional representation, surely you're not required to walk out if others vote for it. You'll destroy the convention if you leave. Perhaps it is best if we leave this resolution for a while. I propose, Mr. Chairman, that we postpone discussion and voting on the second resolution of the Virginia Plan. Second? And let every state consider well losing its vote in Congress. The Virginia Plan does no such thing. Order. The proposal has been made and seconded. All in favor of postponing discussion of the second resolution signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed signify by saying no. We will take up discussion of other resolutions of Governor Randolph's plan in committee tomorrow. Today's session is adjourned. And so the great issue of the convention has been postponed. No doubt to allow John Dickinson of Delaware and delegates from the other small states time to concoct a plan to defeat proportional representation in Congress. Yes? Something to eat, Mr. Madison. Thank you. Thank you. You never get out into the air, Mr. Madison. You convention here all day, and then you shut yourself up in here all night. You really should take your ease, like the other delegates. Mrs. House, I, I need to transcribe my notes. Please, I... Thank you.
Thank you very much. for some weeks in debates on the war-making power of Congress, the court system, the strength of our executive, and so on. As expected, the Carolinas and Georgia have insisted on retaining the importation of slaves. John Rutledge of South Carolina leads their fight. Gentlemen, our economies in the South bring great wealth to this nation. But we must be allowed to continue the importation of slaves. Chairman, Mr. King. Mr. Rutledge calls it importation. It eases the consciences of the Southerners to use a word which applies to merchandise. But men and women are not produce, Mr. Rutledge. You do not import slaves. You kidnap them. Here, here, Mr. King. It is iniquitous, Chairman. Mr. Sherman. Now, Mr. Morris, I think the slave trade is iniquitous, too. But you know, and every man in this room knows, that the southern states will never confederate with us if we insist they give it up. Mr. Sherman is correct. Morality has nothing to do with this argument. Interest alone is the governing principle with nations. And if the northern states consult their interest, they will see that slavery benefits their shipping. Mr. Chair. Chair recognizes Colonel Mason from Virginia. You are wrong, Mr. Rutledge. This is a moral issue. Nations cannot be punished in the next world for their sins. So they must be punished in this one. Slavery will bring the judgment of heaven on this country. Mark my words. But Colonel Mason, you are a slave owner yourself. Out of order, Mr. Sherman. No, no, Mr. Chairman. I will answer that. I do not say that slavery can be abolished overnight. But its increase can. It was British merchants who started the infernal traffic. And as Americans, we must end it. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Pinckney, South Carolina, if left at liberty, may stop importing slaves, as Virginia and Maryland have done. But if coerced, never. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Wilson. If you are disposed to end importing soon, why not do it now? Surely no state will stay out of the Union over this. Mr. Chairman, Dr. Williamson, I rise to assure my colleague from Pennsylvania that North Carolina would stay out of the Union. The entire South will stay out of the Union. But we are willing to compromise. I move that all importation of slaves cease after the year 1808, 20 years from now. This will give us adequate time to prepare for such a radical change in our economies. I second Mr. Rutledge's motion. The business of government, gentlemen, is compromise. Let's get this infernal business over with. That we would be forced to accept the Southern position on slavery was a foregone conclusion. But it is a blight in our convention and our country. Dickinson remained silent over the issue of representation in Congress. But as more small state delegates have now arrived, that will soon change. I am finding curious differences in the degree with which the delegates possess the democratic spirit. James Wilson of Pennsylvania is certainly the most democratic-minded. He has argued for direct election of all offices by the people. Others favor appointment to national offices. We have decided that senators will be selected by state legislatures, which to Wilson is a defeat. With the state legislature. Oh! 
<laughs> of course, it's not a proper course, Mr. Madison. Care for a bash? Oh, no, no. I, uh, thank you. Some of the gentlemen, um, excuse me. Some of the gentlemen in my delegation believe you place too much confidence in the people, Judge Wilson. Do they? What do you suppose they mean by that? Well, they've observed that you, uh, you wish to put the election of all members of the national government directly into the hands of the people. And what do you believe? I, I'm inclined to listen to your views, sir. <sighs> I have to be careful here. There's a wee reward for sinking the putt on the last hole. Well? I believe that rulers are useless without the people they rule. Kings, blue-blooded aristocrats, presidents and parliaments, they are the servants. The people are their superiors and sovereigns. So the people ought to choose every blessed one of them. Otherwise they get to thinking they're important on their own, which of course they're not. <laughs> and now, the reward. <sighs> Mr. Madison, something to enliven your tea? Thank you, no. If we start letting state legislators pick senators and senators pick presidents, we'll wind up with all the tyranny and bad government we deserve. Do you believe in complete democracy, sir? Do you want this nation to remain secure in its liberty? Leave it in the hands of the people. The June 9th session of this convention will now come to order. Mr. Chairman, I recognize Mr. Dickinson. We of Delaware, and indeed others here, feel that it is now the proper time to review the most troublesome uh, resolution in the Virginia Plan how the states will be represented in our new Congress. If representation follows population, the large states will always control the legislature. Delaware's voice will never be heard. We will never confederate. If this pernicious scheme is adopted. Wilson, we are not talking about states, but people. Yeah. Are not the citizens of Pennsylvania equal to those of Delaware? Yeah. Does it require 150 of the former to balance 50 of the latter? Yeah. I will never confederate on Mr. Dickinson's principles. Let the small states do as they please. The rest of us will unite. Here, here. Pennsylvania and Virginia wish to strip us of our equal rights of suffrage. Now, they talk of equality, but what they really want is an enormous and monstrous influence. Now, now. Order, gentlemen, order. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Sherman. We can't start arguing and threatening on this issue. Now, I thought of a plan that ought to satisfy everyone here. Let's have the members of the lower house of the legislature be elected according to the population in each state, just as the Randolph plan says. That ought to satisfy the larger states. And then in the upper house, the Senate, let's have each state have just one vote. One vote and no more, just as we've got in the Congress now. That ought to please the smaller states. And I say, let's not argue about it. Let's vote on it. Second. Very well, let us vote on the first half of Mr. Sherman's compromise. All those in favor of the lower house of the legislature being represented according to population of inhabitants signify by saying aye. Those opposed, no. Massachusetts? Aye. 
Connecticut. Connecticut votes aye to the first part of the compromise and urges all the small states to follow her lead. New York. Aye. New Jersey. No. We will wait, Mr. Sherman, to see if the large states keep their part of the compromise. Pennsylvania? Aye. Delaware? No. Maryland? Aye. May the larger states remember their part in this compromise. Virginia? Aye. North Carolina? Aye. South Carolina? Aye. Georgia? Aye. The motion passes in committee nine seats to two New Hampshire absent. Representation in the lower house of the legislature will be proportional. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Sherman. All right, you larger states now have your proportional representation in the lower house. I now move we vote on having each state in the upper house have one vote and one vote only. I remind the large states, Mr. Dickinson has said, the smaller states will never agree to a plan that doesn't give them their fair share in Congress. I second Mr. Sherman's motion. Very well, without discussion, I will call for the vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Those opposed, no. Massachusetts? No. What, sir? You do not honor our compromise? Your compromise, sir. Massachusetts. You might have known. Out of order, sir. The roll call will continue. Connecticut? Aye. New York? Aye. With dissent. Noted. New Jersey? Aye. Pennsylvania? No, Mr. Sherman. No. Delaware? Aye. Maryland? Maryland votes aye. With dissent. Noted, Mr. Jennifer. Virginia? No. North Carolina? No. South Carolina? No. Georgia? No. Mr. Sherman's second motion fails. Now you've torn it. Mr. Chairman. The chair recognizes Mr. Alexander Hamilton. I move the representation in the upper house be determined in exactly the same manner as the lower that is according to population. Second, and while the issues are fresh in the minds of all the delegates, I call for the vote no. Yeah. Indeed. Very well. The states will signify as usual. Massachusetts? Aye. Connecticut? This is outrageous. Never in my life. Let's vote, Mr. Sherman. Connecticut votes now and forever. No. New York? No. New York is a large state, but we are for genuine equality. Mr. Yates, along with Governor Clinton, is for anything that keeps up the trade war with New Jersey. <laughs> Out of order, Mr. Hamilton. New Jersey? No. Pennsylvania? Aye. Delaware? No. And let me warn the Out of order, Mr. Bedford. Maryland? No. Dissent. Noted, Mr. Jennifer. Virginia? Virginia is for genuine equality in this matter. Aye. Aye. North Carolina? Aye. South Carolina? Aye. Georgia? Georgia votes aye. <laughs> Hamilton's motion carries in committee six states to five, New Hampshire absent. That ends debate on the Virginia plan in the committee of the whole. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Dickinson. This vote taken in committee is not a binding vote. We all know that. We, that is the small states must deliberate. We ask for one day's postponement. Pardon me, sir. might as well leave the convention. We mustn't rush into extremes. Madison is right. We must not lose the opportunity to strengthen our country. Madison is a nationalist and Wilson is another. And I am another. Some of us act as though this is some debating contest. It is not. The life of the Union is at stake. Mr. Dickinson, the life of General Delaware is also I believe we can get the Virginia plan referred back into committee. But how would you If it? we have something to put forward against it. I have been writing such a plan, Mr. Yates. It is purely federal. It keeps most of the Articles of Confederation and gives us our fair vote in Congress. Excellent. Dan Carroll is leaving the convention. That leaves Mr. Jennifer and myself in the Maryland delegation. And as you know, Mr. Jennifer is a nationalist. Maryland's vote will be neutralized. That must be prevented somehow. I tell you, I will never confederate without my state's fair vote in the Senate. On that, we are all agreed. Mr. Bedford, we must try. Much depends on your plan, Mr. Patterson.
but the Virginia plan has already been thoroughly debated. It is ready for a binding vote in General Assembly. Why should it be sent back into Committee of the Whole? So that it may be discussed on an equal footing with Mr. Patterson's plan. And the convention is so voted six states to five. The session is adjourned until tomorrow. The gentleman may come forward to make copies of Mr. Patterson's proposals. the consequence of pushing things too far. If you had followed Mr. Sherman's compromise, your plan would never have been returned to committee. But you insist on sweeping all before you to the advantage of the large states. To no one's advantage, sir, but the American people's. Indeed. Then this convention meets in vain. Where is the advantage to the American people then? Mr. Madison, do you like music? Jefferson prefers the violin. Yes. <laughs> Do you have a preference? Um, I, uh, I am, I'm afraid, uh, unrefined in my tastes in music. Uh, so long as it's quiet, I'm content. Ah. It seems to me we have achieved a great deal at this convention. As the architect of the Virginia plan, you are to be congratulated. Thank you, sir. But now, it is time to compromise on the composition of the Senate. Never. It's inequitable. True. And now they want to refer the Virginia plan back into committee. I think Sherman is behind that. In Roger Sherman, you may well find the salvation of your plan. His compromise brought the small states closer to its adoption than any other speech made on the floor. You voted against it. So did Dr. Franklin. We were wrong to do so. We must take care. Another loss, and proud men like Dickinson will abandon the convention. Well, let them. We still maintain the majority. A simple majority is not enough. What we need, Mr. Madison, is consensus among us. Harmony. That alone will ensure the Constitution's success. History will not forgive us. History? Yes. You persuaded me to come to this convention. Well, here I am, Mr. Madison. And I will not see this convention crumble around me because the brightest and stubbornest of us will not yield the Senate to the states. It is not only me, sir. You heard Mr. Wilson say that Pennsylvania will not confederate on the one state, one vote principle. Pennsylvania? Yes. Let Pennsylvania take care of itself. I'm very fond of this music. It is so 
harmonious. Gentlemen, we have heard Mr. Patterson's plan. It maintains the status quo magnificently, but it offers no remedies to the evils that have brought us all to Philadelphia. Mr. Chairman, Mr. King. I move that we reject the Patterson plan in committee and send the Virginia plan back to the General Assembly for debate and binding votes. I second the motion. Mr. Sherman. Out of order, Mr. Patterson. We need a compromise, but your plan won't work, Mr. Patterson. He just keeps us in the mire. At least Governor Randolph tries to pull us out. Very well. Vote in the usual manner. And so the dangerous plan of Mr. Patterson was defeated. For the last several days, the Virginia plan has been debated in General Assembly. The arguments over representation in the Senate go on and on. Alexander Hamilton, tired of being constantly outvoted, has left the convention and gone home to New York. The larger states proceed as if we were blind. Now, Mr. Madison insists that the large states will never hurt the small states if we give up our equality in the Senate. But I do not trust you, sir. Let the large states do as they like. There are other recourses for the smaller states. We can find some foreign ally, someone of, of more honor and good faith who will take us by the hand and do us justice. Mr. Bedford has spoken is treason. Whatever may be my distress, I will never, never quote relief from a foreign power. Gentlemen, gentlemen, this bickering does not further our cause. Never. Chair recognizes Dr. Franklin. Thank you, General. Gentlemen. Gentlemen, the small progress we have made in these last weeks is a melancholy proof of the imperfections of human understanding. How has it happened that we have forgotten to humbly implore the Father of Lights to illuminate our understanding? During the late contests with Great Britain, we many times offered prayers for help in this very room and our prayers were heard and they were graciously answered the longer i live the more convincing proofs i see of this truth that god governs in the affairs of men if a sparrow cannot fall without his notice is it probable that a great nation can rise without his aid? I hereby adjourn this convention until July 2nd, three days hence. The states upon return to General Assembly will be prepared for their final votes on representation in the Senate.
Anything, gentlemen? No, thank, thank, you. thank you. Perhaps later, Mrs. House. Thank you. Mr. Madison, we are on the brink of disaster. This convention will fracture if there's any more debate on representation. But we can still win, General. We have the vote. The battle, yes. What about the war? I wonder if we do have the votes. We have Virginia, the Carolinas, Georgia, Pennsylvania, and Massachusetts. The small states have Delaware, Connecticut, New Jersey, and New York. Maryland will split between Jennifer, who is with us, and Martin, who is with them. We will win. Six states to four. Uh, not so, I'm afraid. Pearson Few of Georgia have left for New York. Why? To attend Congress. In addition, Mr. Pierce is engaged to fight a duel. Mr. Hamilton, I believe, is to act as his second. Well, that still leaves Houston uh, and... Baldwin. Baldwin in the Georgia delegation. Now, Houston will vote with us. What about Baldwin? Abraham Baldwin is new to the state of Georgia. He immigrated there three years ago. But he was born and bred in Connecticut. All right. Georgia may divide along with Maryland, but we still win five states to four. We may. No, we will. We will. I feel very confident. Mr. Jennifer is not here. How long can you wait? I cannot, Mr. Madison. We begin at 11. My second session of this convention will come to order. Where is Mr. Jennifer? Mr. Madison, you are out of order. I'm sure I don't know, Mr. Madison. Indisposed, perhaps. Mr. President. To recognize the delegate from Connecticut, Mr. Oliver Ellsworth. I call the question on the issue which has plagued this house for so long. I move that in the new Senate, each state will have one vote. Yeah, yeah. President, I second my colleague's motion. Very well. States will vote on Mr. Ellsworth's motion in the usual manner. <laughs> Massachusetts. No. Connecticut. Aye. New York. Aye. New Jersey. Aye. Pennsylvania. No. Delaware. Aye. Maryland. Maryland votes aye. Mr. President, it appears as though the Maryland delegation is not fully represented. Mr. Jennifer is not here. That has not hindered votes in the past, and neither will it now. So long as Mr. Jennifer is in Philadelphia, our rules allow Maryland's vote to be cast. Say again, Mr. President, Maryland votes aye. So noted, Mr. Martin. Virginia. No. North Carolina. No. South Carolina. No. Georgia. How does Georgia vote, Mr. House? Mr. President, uh, Georgia is divided. I vote no. Mr. Baldwin votes aye. Very well. General Assembly, one state absent, Georgia divided. Convention uh, voted five to five on Mr. Ellsworth's motion at the time. As the delegation from Maryland is now complete, I move we vote a second time on Mr. Ellsworth's motion. Second. Mr. President. I shall recognize the delegate from Maryland, Mr. Mark. May I remind certain gentlemen that in committee of the whole, this body may vote a second time on a motion, or as many times as it wishes, but in general <laughs> assembly, it is simply not permitted. Our votes are binding and final. Mr. Martin's point of order is correct. Tie stands. Mr. President. Chair recognized delegate from Connecticut. Well, we're at a place where we can't move one way or another. Do we just go home and admit we failed? Let's try a committee. Let's have one delegate from each state get together and try to figure out a compromise. Mr. President. Mr. Madison. I am sensible for the need of compromise in some cases, but I am against this committee. It will merely delay us. Anything that can be proposed in a committee can just as easily be proposed right here. Yeah. Mr. President. You're 
recognize Mr. Dickens. Can it be that Mr. Madison opposes a committee because he fears that reasonable men, out of earshot of his rhetoric, will uphold equality in the Senate? Here, here. I am in favor. Mr. President. Can I recognize Dr. Franklin? We are at a dead stop, Mr. Madison. It is time to compromise, sir. <laughs> Glorious Fourth. They're calling it the Grand Committee. <laughs> they ought to call it the Pact Committee. <laughs> Look who's on it. Every small state sympathizer in the convention. Well, Dr. Franklin is representing your state. He is an old diplomatist. He will, as he would put it, compromise for the higher good. No, the Senate will be a non-democratic body. We've lost. Yes. Aye. But look how much we've won. Won? At the beginning of this convention, the delegates were willing to tinker with the articles. But in their most fearful nightmares of democracy, they never envisioned giving up state sovereignty. Think of it. Petulant little Delaware threatened to walk out. Then they voted for a strong national government. Why? Because you came to Philadelphia with a plan. I hope neither of you gentlemen will be wanting a meal. I'm that short-handed now with the celebrations going on in town and all that I can't be offering cooking now. Well, thank you, no. This drinks will be fine. Of course, you come back tonight and you'll see us at our busiest. Boy, we keep the glorious fourth in grander fashion than any tavern in town. No doubt, sir. Uh, sir? Tell me, where do you stand on the issue of good government? Well, we here at the tavern don't want a king, and that's flat. Nor shall you have one, sir. I give you my word. And, of course, we want ale kept at a fair price. <laughs> <laughs> I've been doing a lot of reading on these new ideas for government. Well, yeah, Mr. Madison, you see, we Americans have the advantage. We read and comprehend issues. And I want a government that's not just for you, and not just for me, and that's even and fair for everyone. By my reckoning, that's a good government. Would you join us, sir, in a drink to the fourth? That I will, sir. To the American people, the foundation of our liberty. Before our departure, I wish to make it clear to the House that both Mr. Lansing and myself oppose and will continue to oppose any system which has in object the consolidation of these United States into one government. Yeah. I've made up my mind. No. July 10, 1787. My dear Mr. Hamilton, debate of the report of the Grand Committee proceeds without an end in sight. Your colleagues, Messrs. Yates and Lansing, have left the convention for New York, vowing to work against the convention. It is the first time an entire state has left. I am sorry you went away. I wish you were back. Our councils are now, if possible, in a worse train than ever. I am, sir, yours truly, George Washington. I am ready to ride in an hour. Gentlemen, we have now debated the compromise report of the Grand Committee for nine days. I, for one, have grown weary of the long-windedness of its detractors. I, therefore, call the question on the report. Second, we are as ready to resolve the question as you are, sir. Very well. As debated and amended, 
This compromise provides for a lower house which represents the states according to their population. In the upper house, each state will have two senators, each senator will have one vote. I remind the gentleman his vote will be binding. Massachusetts. Massachusetts is divided, sir. What? Mr. Strong and I vote aye. Mr. King and Mr. Gorham vote no. Connecticut. Connecticut votes in favor of the Grand Committee's compromise. Here, here. New Jersey. House welcomes back Mr. Hamilton. Thank you, Mr. President. Would someone please uh, give uh, Mr. Hamilton a copy of this report? I will uh, come to New York last. And I'll proceed with the roll call. New Jersey. Aye. Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, despite its elder statesman being on the committee, concludes that it will vote against its report. My disappointment over this is mitigated by the fact that at least I live here in Philadelphia and can be carried to my home each night of this interminable convention. <laughs> Delaware. Uh, I. Maryland. Aye. Please, you can be with us for this vote, Mr. Jennifer. Virginia. No. With exception. Noted, sir. North Carolina. North Carolina is in favor of the compromise. South Carolina. No. Georgia. No. Mr. Hamilton, have you had sufficient time to read the report? I have, Mr. President. Are you prepared to cast New York to vote on it? I am. New York, without hesitation, votes nothing. I beg New your York pardon. Votes nothing. Point of order, Mr. President. Mr. Dickinson, in the middle of a vote, this seems hardly the time. Our rules are very specific. A state, in order to be represented by a quorum, must have at least two delegates in the city. Two in the city, gentlemen. New York has only one. Therefore, Mr. Hamilton may not vote. The gentleman from Delaware is correct. I'm sorry. Oh. Oh. With Massachusetts divided, New York ineligible and New Hampshire absent, the compromise report passes in General Assembly. I say support. We've done it. And now for other business. Mr. President. The chair recognizes Governor Randolph. Mr. President, I move that this convention adjourn that the large states might consider a compromise. A true compromise, not this sham which benefits only the small states. Mr. President. Yeah, I recognize Mr. Patterson. Let the large states take a day to hatch their scheme, but we will never back down from this binding vote. This convention is adjourned until tomorrow morning. There are still a great many issues to debate in this convention. And...
you got out early this morning, Mr. Madison. built upon the foundation proposed by the small states. Nor will it. I agree. It's time to move on to other matters. The small states are fixed. We must yield on the representation issue. Hmm. At last, someone sees the truth of the matter. The small states have compromised, gentlemen. Now we must. You are strangely quiet, Mr. Madison. Judge Wilson and Dr. Franklin are correct. No one could be more disappointed than myself that the convention has chosen what to me seems an unjust system. This great compromise has created a new kind of nation, one such as I had never considered. Its national government is strong and sovereign, but it has states which are also strong, separate states, but a united people. It is neither man nor horse, but like the centaur, half of each. I don't know whether such a creature can survive in the rough and tumble of the world, but I am willing to make the hazard. I am for the compromise. I am for the united states. report of the Grand Committee was approved, a key issue of the convention was decided. During the next eight hot, humid weeks, the House debated, amended, and approved the other resolutions of the Virginia Plan in General Assembly. A committee of style refined the language of the new Constitution. I am especially fond of the preamble, not we the states, but we the people. This shows to all the world that in America, the people will govern. This body is now ready to vote in General Assembly. Major Jackson will now read the final draft of the Constitution of the United States. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. Article 1, Section 1. All legislative powers herein granted shall be vested in the Congress of the United States, which shall consist of a Senate and House of Representatives. The House of Representatives shall be composed of members chosen by secondary danger as well as not president of today. The executive power shall be vested in the President of the United States of America. He shall hold his office during the term of four years, and together with the vice president and misdemeanors. The judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one Supreme Court, and in such inferior courts as the Congress may from time to time not be convened against domestic violence. The Congress, whenever two-thirds of both houses shall deem it necessary, shall propose amendments to this Constitution, or on the application of the legislature of two-thirds of the several states shall be made under the authority of the United States, shall be the supreme law of the land. The senators and representatives before mentioned by all members to support this Constitution, but no religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to any office or public trust under the United States. 
The ratification of conventions of nine states shall be sufficient for the establishment of this Constitution before the states. Done in convention by the unanimous consent of the states present, the 17th day of September in the year of our Lord, 1787, and of the independence of the United States of America, the 12th. Thank you, Major Terry. Mr. President, Dr. Franklin, I confess there are parts of this Constitution I do not yet approve, but I am not sure I shall never approve of them. Because the older I grow, the more I doubt my own judgment and pay attention to the judgment of others. <laughs> when you get together a group of men to take advantage of their wisdom, of course you get all their passions and their prejudices, their errors and their selfish views. Can a perfect production be expected from this? I am astonished to find it approaching so near perfection as it does. Yes, gentlemen, yes, I, I consent to this Constitution. And I urge all others to do so. Because I expect none better. And I'm not sure it is not the best. Thank you, Dr. Franklin. We will now vote on whether or not to accept the Constitution. Gentlemen. This vote will be binding. New Hampshire. Aye. Massachusetts. Massachusetts votes aye. Connecticut. Mr. President, Connecticut is pleased with the compromises of this body. She votes aye. New Jersey. Aye. Pennsylvania. Aye. Delaware. Aye. Maryland. Aye. Virginia. Virginia votes aye. Colonel Mason is accepted. Colonel Mason? Mr. President, I have been wrestling with myself the last several days, and I feel duty-bound to say that I would sooner chop off my right hand than put it to the Constitution as it now stands. But why, sir? There's no declaration of rights in this document. This comes very late, sir, when we are on the verge of concluding our business. If you feel so strongly on this point, sir, why did you not mention it sooner? I feel that such a bill could be prepared in a few hours. Mr. President. Mr. Sherman of Connecticut. We don't need a Bill of Rights in the Constitution because all the states have already got one. Mr. Sherman is correct. We have written this Constitution with the express intent of protecting the people from... Nevertheless, generations of Americans yet unborn will look back to us for protection of their rights. We must not fail them. Thank you, Colonel. This convention appreciates your candor. I express my personal regret, sir, that you cannot find yourself a friend to this document. Mr. President, I also accept myself. <laughs> but you presented the Virginia plan. I have many reservations as to the form in which it has been cast. I know I am taking a step which may be the most awful of my life, but it is dictated by my conscience. Your exception is noted, sir. Um, well, gentlemen, shall we proceed with the roll call? North Carolina. North Carolina votes aye. South Carolina? Aye. Georgia? Aye. Unanimously, 11 states to none, this convention has, on this day, September 17, 1787, voted to accept as its ruling document the Constitution of the United States.
Mr. President. Mr. Hamilton. Though I am unable to vote on the motion, I will sign the Constitution so that New York may be represented on so important a document. If I might be allowed that honor. Indeed you may, sir. Well, uh, what remains for us to do is sign. <laughs> this is for me a great moment. I prayed for it. And I will continue to pray for the success of this document. For I believe it to be the hope of this country. have found it difficult to distinguish in their art a rising sun from a setting sun. In the midst of my hopes and fears during this convention, I have often looked at the sun on the president's chair without being able to tell whether it was rising or setting. But now I have the happiness to know it is a rising sun. more difficult than can be conceived by those who were not concerned in its execution. Men of different minds and diverse opinions came together to debate our great cause, and yet the degree of concord which ultimately prevailed was a miracle. Constitution needs now to be ratified by the supreme authority of the people themselves. Yours very sincerely, James Madison. I know, I know. Mr. Adams, really? There, Lord Carmarthen. There you have on your obstructionist desk the most important document ever written. A piece of paper that will change the world. Read it well. It marks the end of England's domination of the hemisphere. From this moment, America takes her place as an equal in the family of nations. Gentlemen.
may take the oath. I solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Long live George Washington, President of the United States! Watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.